Hello, 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 everybody. I'm here today covering the RevForce engine, recently covered by Driving for Answers. And as a spin, I am covering my personal due diligence on their upcoming crowdfunding campaign. Uh, Driving for Answers didn't mention the crowdfunding campaign necessarily, but he did have a call to review this for hedge fund managers and individuals of vast personal wealth to invest in it, because it is one of his favorite designs, he says so. Uh, it is very interesting. It potentially solves the exhaust problems associated with two-stroke two engines. Um, two strokes have been called to be the prime mover for a long time, and then they were essentially obsoleted because they can't meet emissions. Because the normal two-stroke has your air come in through the crankcase and up into the cylinder, which is very is very power dense. You're using the space. It's very efficient on space, but your air goes right through the oil. You got to put oil in your gas. You end up with oil getting burned and going out the exhaust. Uh, not so great for emissions. They're essentially obsolete today, except for some off-road applications. This could potentially change that, cleaning up the emissions. So it is a supercharged rotor exhaust valve two-stroke engine with the air coming in through the cylinder walls rather than through the crank. So that is the base uh, advantages of this engine. Now, there's some interesting controversy. Two-stroke stuffing came out with a video as well saying, hey, these guys uh, came up with this engine. I've been working on this engine for years. Um, what's the big deal? They, they stole my design and patented it. Um, some later comments from him later. Seems like he's maybe walked back that he's recognizing some of the differences in the engine. Uh, but that is the original tone of the video. Um, now, he does have a very similar engine in the perspective that I just mentioned. It is a, also a rotary exhaust. There's his technical drawing. This guy's humor is great. Um, but here, his prototype, it has a rotary exhaust. Uh, supercharged two-stroke engine and the air goes through some transfer ports and not through the crank so it does not pick up engine oil. Uh, this is all the formula that gets the benefit that the RevForce engine is claiming which is getting the power density that you need uh, that we all want and still meeting emissions, or at least having a path to meet emissions. Okay, so a uh, little bit on timing. The brute force engine by two-stroke stuffing was first described, as best I can tell, in April of 2021. That would be a problem for the patent of Auto Cycle, uh, uh, sorry, Alpha Auto Technologies, their Rev Force engine. That would be a problem because they claim a priority date back in, choo -choo -choo, should be 2022, see where it says it. Here we go, August 15th, 2022. You have one year from disclosing anything to filing a provisional patent application, or it is considered prior art and you cannot patent it. If they had claimed exactly what was shown this basic engine architecture with a forced induction, uh, rotor exhaust valve, in fact, the patent doesn't even get into two stroke, but an engine with a uh, forced induction, rotor exhaust valve, air that bypasses the uh, crankcase in a two cycle, that would have been void. <laughs> it would not have worked. Um, you can't patent that. So I am explaining today that that is not what they patented. They did not patent that. Um, they patented something far more narrow. Uh, I'll get into some comments from, uh, from the patent examiners about it. And here's, here's just an interesting conclusion. Since the common technical features are previously disclosed by the song reference, the song engine, by the way, not a, not a great engine, in my opinion. Um, these comments are not special, and so groups one and two lack unity. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing patentable with their design. What it means is that the engine architecture that they must have been trying to propose 
if they wanted it all in one patent, it wasn't enough. Uh, all of the individual components that they were trying to do have been described elsewhere. This song patent, by the way, it's a beast. It's um, got everything on it except it's not power dense. It's got eight cycles, it's got water injection, it has overhead uh, poppet valves with a crank, and has rotary exhaust and intake valves. It's <laughs> um, not the best engine if you're going for power density. But nevertheless, they, they used it as a reference saying everything that you're trying to claim here as a thing is a thing in this other engine. Uh, nothing's unique from an individual component perspective. I mean, really, you can't, you gotta kind of split this out. You, the engine architecture by itself is not unique. Okay. So what is it that they actually claimed in their issued patent? So uh, just quick note, I'm a random guy on YouTube doing my own personal analysis, due diligence for the upcoming crowdfunding campaign. Should I decide to invest, uh, you may have a good indication of whether I will decide to invest or not based off of what I'm showing here in the patent analysis. Um, but this is my own personal due diligence, okay? so. Um, we already walked through kind of the engine architecture for the rev force, uh, root force. I don't think I showed this one yet. Um, similar thing. You got a supercharger. You've got the crank. You've got the rotor exhaust valve. It's belt driven. That will become important later. Um, and then we'll kind of get into the claims. They only have three independent claims. The only thing that matters when you're evaluating a patent, unless there's an actual challenge where somebody invalidates the um, independent claim is the independent claims. And even if they do, whatever comes out of that will be even more narrow than the independent. So as long as you do not meet the definition on the independent claim, you're not infringing. There's nothing else that can be done uh, to exclude you from participating in the market because you're not the same thing. <coughs> so I tried to translate these independent claims into numbered lists of components that are a little more easy to read because patent, patent language is more difficult to read. So independent claim one essentially says you, ha uh, you have an air pump, an engine crankshaft, engine cr crankshaft position sensor, cylinder with sidewalls that have intake and exhaust openings, intake manifold disposed between the air pump and the intake port, a piston assembly, an exhaust pipe, and rotary exhaust valve with variable timing. Up until this rotary exhaust valve with variable timing, Essentially, they're saying you have an engine. <laughs> um, so now we have an engine with rotary exhaust valve with variable timing and a rotary exhaust valve position sensor. So it's not just a rotary exhaust valve. It's one that can phase with respect to the engine. A stub port from the exhaust port to the rotary exhaust valve. An ECU, all engines have an ECU. And an ECU calculating the speed of the crankshaft, calculating the speed of the rotor exhaust valve, and adjusting valve phasing assembly to ensure 50% speed of the crankshaft. This right here, that is why I think they lost an argument uh, with the patent examiners. And if you look at the comments, too, from the patent examiners, they were talking about the first few were talking, were including a stub port. There are additions beyond the stub port. So my thought is they were going for this and they lost. And they had to add in, uh, I don't know if the ECU was there before or not, doesn't really matter, all modern engines for, well, all modern engine applications have an ECU, although it's not necessary to run, so probably they wouldn't even uh, have had this in their claims. Um, but they added this other very narrowing aspect, likely to get the thing patented. So what does this mean? An ECU calculating the speed of the crankshaft, calculating the speed of the rotor exhaust valve, and adjusting the assembly, valve phasing assembly. Now, the valve phasing assembly is described up here. Um, that gives you your variable timing. So you can run your exhaust valve and, and directly tie it to your crank, and then your timing is set. It always opens and closes at the same time, unless you have a little motor on there to shift it relative to the position of where it is with the belt, and then you can change, depending on RPM or whatever you want to change to, you can change your timing of what degrees after top dead center, bottom top dead center, etc., that it's open. So that's, that's a very good thing for optimizing every speed, every engine RPM. 
But now they're saying they want to take that and use it to adjust to make sure that they're always at 50% speed of the crankshaft. So they're, let's say, doing their change in between RPMs at the time where it's closed so you're not overlapping and changing your, your when it's open, when it's closed. This is, in my opinion, completely unnecessary. Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that adds a whole lot of value, especially with the 50% speed of the crankshaft thing, because you could have a valve that is 100% or 200% or 150% that you're running instead. So 50% just means that since this is symmetrical across its axis, it doesn't matter if it's this side open or that side open. In fact, that's what you want if you want it open uh, longer times. So that means this is running slower with respect to the, to the crank. So that's a good thing if you want to have wider option for it being open. But there's no reason why I have to do it that way. <laughs> I can run it twice as fast and not be infringing. So that really narrows the patent. This 50% speed part and the ECU correcting things, that's all excessively narrow and well outside what I see as being done in the brute force engine. So I'll just dig into that last part because that's the part that really kind of makes the patent of minimal value in my opinion. So the actual wording. Receive a continuous crankshaft position output from the crankshaft position sensor, okay? Receive a continuous rotary exhaust valve position output from the rotary exhaust valve sensor. Okay, so two inputs. You're getting your crankshaft position, rotary exhaust valve position. You calculate the speed of each You through the ECU. So the ECU is making a calculation. It is comparing the two, sending out a signal to control it to make sure that they're always at 50%. So this is a, this is a control mechanism to make sure that they're always at target. That uses the ECU. Again, you could just drive this with a belt. That's what brute force engine is doing. And unless there's a lot of slop in the belt or there's some other reason that you're having trouble, uh, I don't see any need to be doing control mechanisms to adjust. So here's kind of the, the diagram for that valve phasing assembly and then kind of where they talk about it in the actual patent language saying variable timing engine speeds and loads by a valve phasing assembly. So my guess is they were originally describing this with respect to the ability to phase to change your timing. That would make more sense. Um, and then they had to add this in because this limits things vastly. Why is your ECU affecting your speed? Why is that involved in your speed things? It should just be a direct ratio of how big your gear is here attached to the belt and how big the gear is on your crankshaft. That's all you would need. So if you take a look at independent claims two and three, they also have this complicating factor with an ECU. And again, they probably lost their argument and had to add this in in order to get a patent. Just my conjecture. So, uh, moving into independent claim two, it needs to have an engine crankshaft, crankshaft position sensor, cylinder with sidewalls, piston assembly, exhaust pipe, rotary exhaust valve that can face, okay, variable timing, rotary exhaust, uh, rotary exhaust valve position sensor, ECU. And the last one, an ECU calculating the crankshaft position and exhaust position such that the exhaust port is closed from 120 degrees after top dead center to 50 degrees after bottom dead center. All of that could have been done with a belt, except for perhaps the variable timing exhaust. But even that, you could have a little mechanism that just changes it up or down based off of something else tied to RPM. You don't need to go through the ECU to do that. It's probably, it could potentially be easier, but it is not necessary. And the same problem with independent claim three. All of those things described in the engine <clears throat> with a rotary exhaust valve that can phase, variable timing exhaust, but the ECU is calculating the position to make sure it's open when they want it open. So you could have an engine architecture that looks slightly different where you wouldn't need that range. So it wouldn't necessarily need to be 
at least partially open at 90 degrees after top dead center and close between 120 degrees after top dead center to 50 degrees after bottom dead center. That is the range that works best with their engine architecture. Uh, brute force engine or any other engine that's using supercharged two stroke uh, variable exhaust valve, or sorry, not variable, um, rotary exhaust valve. They could just have their ports in different locations and not need to use that range or they could not control it with an ECU. So let's just pretend, I'm, I'm trying to evaluate this company, right? Should I want to invest in them? Let's pretend I'm a competitor to this company. Would I need to license this technology to play in this space with a rotary exhaust valve, supercharged two stroke that could meet emissions? I get all the benefits without having to pay these guys. I don't think so. I don't think I need to license this because all I need to do is not run an ECU to control my valve phasing assemblies. I could run something else. And I don't think it'd be that hard to design around this. So no, brute force engine is not covered by their patent. Uh, the brute force engine is essentially prior art and they probably pushed them uh, along with other patents that were that were discovered, it probably pushed them into these very weak, narrow claims. So, from a market control perspective, I don't think they got it. They, they certainly have a new design that's very interesting, and they're likely going to be first to market because they've got the first prototype and they're raising money and blah, 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 blah. But I don't think they control it long term. And that's a problem, in my mind, for my analysis. Anyway, uh, make your own decisions. Hope this was useful to you, and uh, stay savvy. Thanks. Bye.